president of the Sudra Company, an environmental consulting firm uh, that help people facing problems with chem chemical and environmental contamination, environmental health issues. Uh, she has degrees in microbiology and chemistry. Uh, she served on numerous EPA and other environmental uh, commissions, very, very well versed in these kinds of issues. Um, and she's helped a lot of people in, in and around Louisiana where she's based and where she lives. And um, she's been called the People's Scientist, which I thought was a, a great, uh, great name for her uh, in one of the articles that I saw. So, Wilma, I'm going to turn things over to Thank you. you. Thank you. So mine is going to be a little bit more general. And when I work with communities and I get a call that says, help us understand what's going on, I usually do workshops every two weeks or every month and bring them up to date on what has occurred since the last time we had a meeting. And where he was for you is way, way ahead of what usually I start with on a community because they, they know they have issues, they know they have health impacts but they don't really know what's going on. So that's gonna be what I'm gonna tell you today. So this facility has coal ash impoundments and they have three coal ash impoundments which will serve as potential contamination sources. And they manage the bottom ash generated from the Ericsson power station. The bottom ash consists of large heavier particles which he talked to you about, and they settle out. And then they get leached from the chemicals they have and it moves into the groundwater. So there was fly ash beneficial use began in approximately 1976. The fly ash was treated in a dry system and captured and shipped off site for use in making cement and deposited in a regulated landfill. So what they used to make cement, they had contaminants that they were placing in the cement as the ash was used to make the cement. Then groundwater. And it, we're just in our infancy as far as community groundwater. The groundwater aquifer in the area of the power station consists of the glacial aquifer and then bedrock aquifer or he referred to it as Saginaw aquifer and the shallow glacial aquifer groundwater has been contaminated by the coal ash constituents which were deposited in the impoundments as the facility operated. Based on groundwater monitoring in the glacial aquifer there are six constituents that are in excess of groundwater protection standards and he talked to you about standards and whether they existed or not, and they are consistent groundwater contamination and associated with the coal ash contamination. So the chemicals are boron, lithium, you heard those from me, molybdenum, sulfate, you heard that, calcium, total dissolved solids. Those are the chemicals we know that came from the residue from the facility. The groundwater in the bedrock aquifer is deeper than the glacial aquifer, and it's also contaminated with chemicals associated with the air. And the private wells are in that glacial aquifer are deeper. So if you were tracking the contamination in the aquifer all along, you would have known it was under the facility, and then it was migrating down into the aquifer that services your drinking water wells. The private wells were completed in the Saginaw bedrock aquifer, and the wells were dominated by shale and sandstone and were completed at varying depths between 100 feet and 460 feet. So if you know the depth of your well, it should be in that range, 100 feet below the surface to 460 feet. So the chemicals that were tested in your wells at the beginning of this process were bicarbonates, carbonate, boron, both total and dissolved boron, calcium, chloride, fluoride, lithium, both total and dissolved. You're hearing some of the same ones he was talking about. 
magnesium, molybdenum, total, and dissolved potassium, sodium, sulfate, total dissolved solids, and total suspended solids. So when they did their first look at your groundwater wells, they did a whole host of chemicals. Boron was one of the focuses of the results of your drinking water tests. Boron ranged from 0.15 to 6.3, and he talked to you about the EPA and the state of Michigan do not have drinking water standards for boron. That doesn't mean it's okay that you're drinking them, they just don't have standards, and then you can not say, my well is over the standard. You just can say, my well contains, but not know whether it's over the standard. EPA's lifetime health advisory level for adults is 5.0 and for children 2.0. So backing up, boron and your wells range from 0.15 to 6.3. Of the 52 private wells that were sampled, 38 wells or 73% of the private wells had boron in excess of 2.0 milligrams per liter. EPA's lifetime health level for children is 2.0. Lithium also was in the water and it ranged from 0.007 to 0.096 milligrams per liter. So it's a much more toxic substance because it's at a much lower level than it gives you negative impacts. EPA and the state of Michigan, again, do not have a drinking water standard for lithium. The EPA regional screening level for lithium is 0.4. A total of 16 of the private wells that they sampled, or 31%, almost a third of those wells, exceeded the 0.4 milligrams which EPA adopted. Molybdenum concentrations were all non-detect in the private wells in the area of the focus. So let's look at the health impacts, boron health impacts. Acute meaning short-term health impacts. It irritates the skin and the eyes. It irritates the nose and the throat. It causes coughing and wheezing. It causes headaches, nausea, and vomiting. And the chronic impact, the long-term impact, if you've lived in your house and had that well for a long time, it may damage your liver <coughs> and your kidneys. Then lithium health impacts those acute or short-term exposures. And remember, you get the short-term exposure when you take a shower, take a bath, wash dishes, wash clothes, and any residual remains on the clothes. So lithium acute health impacts irritates and burns the skin and the eyes, irritates the nose, throat, and lungs, causes coughing and our shortness of breath, loss, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, causes headaches, muscle weakness, blurred vision, loss of coordination, tremors, confusion, seizure, and coma. And in the long term or the chronic exposure, it causes kidney and heart functions and it messes up the thyroid gland functions. My husband has cancer. We go to MD Anderson in Houston and this week they found out he had thyroid cancer and they're going through all the things that they didn't go through when his first cancer was chosen. So those are just the things that if you start having or you're still having health impacts, you need to start recording how frequently you have those health impacts, which ones, and if they are associated with any of the chemicals that are known to be present in your drinking water source. And then there's a need to do more testing on the drinking water source and more testing over time, perhaps on a quarterly basis, so you find out are those chemicals in your water changing concentrations based on the time of the year. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Mama. Okay, next up, uh, Evan McGregor.